people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. The second in-person Quad Summit provided a fresh impetus to the Indo-Pacific Focused Security Alliance, which has been under the international media lens since the outbreak of the Russia-Ukraine armed conflict. The leaders cleared the air around the growing speculations of a fallout in the grouping following contrasting individual stances vis-a-vis -vis Russia. They reaffirmed Quad's commitment to a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific and committed to further strengthen the multilateral platform in coming times. The top leadership of the United States, Japan, India and Australia met in Japanese capital Tokyo for the second in-person summit to review the current progress of the Quad grouping, discuss the ongoing political developments and to lay out a future roadmap in the backdrop of the prolonged Russia-Ukraine war. The meeting that was scheduled weeks ago welcomed a new face in the name of Anthony Albanese, the new Prime Minister of Australia, who was elected just hours before the meeting. And like the previous meetings, this summit too focused at achieving inclusivity in the Indo-Pacific and upholding the principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity and peaceful resolution of disputes. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who has consistently faced media scrutiny for the Indian government's neutral position in ongoing Russia-Ukraine war, highlighted the country's principled position on the need for cessation of hostilities, resumption of dialogue and diplomacy. Modi, apart from reiterating the grouping's commitment to a free Indo-Pacific, lauded the integrated efforts of the Quad, which he said were responsible for mitigating a number of challenges faced by the members in the recent past. Quad के स्तर पर हमारे आपसी सहयोग से एक free, open और inclusive Indo-Pacific क्षेत्र को प्रोत्साहन मिल रहा है। COVID-19 की विपरीत परिस्थितियों के बावजूद हमने वैक्सीन डिलीवरी, क्लाइमेट एक्शन, सप्लाई चेन रिजिलिएंस, डिजास्टर रिस्पांस और आर्थिक सहयोग जैसे कई क्षेत्रों में आपसी समन्वय बढ़ाया है। इससे इंडो-पैसिफिक में शांति, समृद्धि और स्थिरता सुनिश्चित हो रही है। The leaders took stock of ongoing Quad collaboration and their vision for the future. The Quad leaders committed to working closely with partners and the region to drive public and private investment to bridge gaps. To achieve this, Quad will seek to extend more than 50 billion US dollars of infrastructure assistance and investment in the Indo-Pacific over the next five years. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida shared concerns over the situation in Ukraine. He underlined in his statement that it wasn't just three, but all four leaders, including Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, were aligned on the importance of the rule of law, sovereignty and territorial integrity. Indo. <laughs> 太平洋地域に及ぼす影響について率直な議論を行い、インドも参加する形でウクライナでの悲惨な紛争について懸念を表明し、法の支配や主権及び領土一体性等の諸原則はいかなる地域においても守らなければならない。
the leaders welcomed the gift of 525,000 doses of Made in India vaccines by India to Thailand and Cambodia in April 2022 under the Quad Vaccine Partnership. A Quad Climate Change Action and Mitigation Package QCHAMP, was announced to strengthen efforts towards green shipping, clean energy including green hydrogen and climate and disaster resilient infrastructure. Several bilateral meetings were also held on the sidelines of the summit where leaders exchanged their views at individual capacity to strengthen ties within the grouping. U.S. President Joe Biden, in a reassuring tone, underscored that Washington wanted to deepen ties with India like never before. Mr. Prime Minister, there's so much that our countries can and will do together, and I'm committed to uh, making U.S.-India partnership among the closest we have on Earth. Quad leaders also announced the opening of applications for the Quad Fellowship Program. The fellowship program will open the doors for 100 students across the four Quad nations to pursue studies in the States. The opportunity can be availed by students pursuing degree in science, technology, engineering and mathematics learning. As per the observers, the meeting turned out to be productive and there is certainly a way forward for the grouping. They believe the Quad has potential to curb threats in the Indo-Pacific and resolve all forms of disputes in the region. Moving on. The United Nations has expressed concern over the deteriorating human rights situation in Taliban-ruled Afghanistan. The UN says the Taliban's increasingly repressive decrees, including the latest one that restricts women's presence at all public places without burqa, are not just the violation of the basic human rights, but are depriving them of the fundamental rights of movement. It urged the group to reverse the decisions that are anti-women and have appealed to work in the direction of public welfare. This is the 21st century Afghanistan. The latest decree, which in Taliban's lexicon is no less than a law, mandates women to wear a full body veil burqa in all public spaces. This comes in line with several restrictions that Taliban have imposed in the war-ravaged country, including no education for girls above sixth grade, no movement without a male company, and several others. More surprising, however, is the fact that Taliban don't even recognize that it is breaching into people's personal space and are violating their basic human rights. The brazenly put out statements of the Taliban have said time and again that they have been strictly following the rules and have given all possible liberty to its citizens. The United Nations, which took a stock of the situation, said Afghanistan was riddled with challenges, especially vis-a-vis -vis human rights situation. Afghanistan is facing a plethora of critical human rights challenges that are having a severe impact on the population. I urge the authorities to acknowledge the human rights challenges that they are facing and to close the gap between their words and their deeds. At the end of an 11-day visit to Afghanistan, Richard Bennett, the UN Special Rapporteur, told reporters the Taliban needed to immediately reverse policies that negatively impacted women's access to public space. He described concerns over severe inhibitions of women's access to education after the group made a U-turn on allowing girls to go to secondary school in March and this month announced rules requiring women to cover their faces to be enforced by punishing their closest male relatives. Measures such as the suspension of secondary edu girls' secondary education, severe barriers to employment, no opportunities to participate in political and public life, limits on freedom of movement, association and expression, directives on maharam, <coughs> enforcing a strict form of hijab and strong advice to stay at home, fit the pattern of absolute gender segregation, 
and are aimed at making women invisible in society. However, like every single time in the past, the Taliban have denied that there was a concerning human rights situation, saying they had paid attention to the issues mentioned and were working on the issue of girls' secondary school education. Women across Afghanistan, especially in capital Kabul, have expressed their opposition with some even taking to streets. But all their demands have suffered is a stone-hearted authority. During the peace process, the Taliban had promised that it would reform itself to provide women their rights, but all those promises have gone for a toss, with the group not in mood to retract on what it has ordered. And with a rapid decline in the women's situation, observers say that not only has Afghanistan become the most suppressive place for women, but it is turning out to be a living hell with the group tightening noose around their neck with every rising sun. One more week into the Sri Lankan economic crisis and there is still no light appearing at the end of the tunnel. Hospitals don't have medicines, homes don't have fuel to cook food. From transportation wars to skyrocketing inflation, it appears that every single sector in the country has come to a halt. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe, who has also taken charge of finance, said he will be presenting the budget in few weeks. There were several steps he talked about during his message to people, but not even one thing on the lines that could infuse even a little sense of hope for Sri Lankans. Ranil Vikramasinghe, who was appointed the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, in a knee-jerk reaction to the growing anger in the island nation a few days back, will also be handling the country's finances amidst the worst economic crisis the country has suffered since 1948, and which doesn't seem to be getting better in weeks or even months. In a message to the nation this week, he said that he will present an interim budget within six weeks. He has hinted at slashing down on infrastructure projects and rerouting funds into a two-year relief program. The inflation rate in the country is hovering around 40, with skyrocketing commodity prices and unprecedented deficit of fuel. Vikramasinghe said he will also be handling the future talks with the global financing body, the International Monetary Fund. Inflation can go well into the 40s. Remember, one is the price adjustments we are making. Secondly is the fact that we printed money. We have no rupee revenue. And now we have to uh, print another trillion rupees. So you just you can see how inflation is, uh, will have an impact here. Observers say while the government has apprised the country about its plans, its roadmap has not infused even modicum of optimism in the citizenry. The situation of deficit and looming devastation continues to persist. Meanwhile, a severe shortage of medicines has spread all across the country, with one of its biggest cancer hospitals warning that the crunch may lead to the death of some patients who could otherwise be saved. The country's healthcare system is close to collapse. It imports more than 80% of its medical supplies, but with foreign currency reserves drying up during the crisis, essential drugs are disappearing from shelves. As a government hospital, we depend on the government supplies. So sometimes even in the morning, we plan for some major surgeries, which we may not be able to do it on that particular day as it is not there. So it will, uh, it's uh, very bad for the cancer patient because the cancer will grow and has a bad defects on the patient outcome. There has been no change in the images that truly define the gravity of fuel shortage in the country. People this week too were seen pushing their vehicles as they waited in lines to patrol stations and women sat on pavements with plastic containers, 
waiting to buy kerosene for cooking. People say while sometimes it takes hours to receive a small amount of fuel on other days, even a long wait ends up in futility. So we are waiting from here to from 6, 6 morning, from the 6 a.m. So still they are not uh, promised to fall is coming or not even. They have increased the price. They are not advised to people to what we have to do. They are not uh, providing the solution. So we ask him from the government what they give the solution for us. Meanwhile, the president of Sri Lanka, Gotabaya Rajpaksa, who is now at the center of public outreach, facing increasing demands of resignation, said that there were countries who were providing finances for the essential medicines. While expressing his gratitude for the expedited Indian support, he said that Japan too was on board to assist it with the bridging financing. The country's leadership, he said, was working to figure out a solution and people needed to trust the process. However, the scenes emerging on the streets of Sri Lanka speak contrary as demonstrations against the Gotabaya administration are only intensifying with a long and loud chorus of Go Gotabaya, Go Gotabaya. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Pakistan's mango farmers are expecting a 50% decline in yield this year as ongoing heat wave and water shortage continues to better the country. Pakistan witnessed an extreme heat wave this month with temperatures in the south crossing 50 degrees Celsius. According to the country's climate change ministry, the South Asian nation had jumped from winter to summer without experiencing a spring. Pakistan is the world's fifth largest mango producer after India, China, Thailand and Indonesia. However, the untimely spike in temperature have dented their production and led to a re-evaluation of export targets. Gundam plastic car models are popular around the world. Their resemblance to real automobiles are commendable. A hobby show was held recently in Shizuoka Prefecture where these models were at display for the general public. Due to the pandemic, after three years, a large gathering attended the event. In 60th edition of the event, around 80 companies and two organizations exhibited their products. The Shizuoka Model Association is a group formed by Shizuoka based manufacturers such as Tamiya Incorporated and more. They have worked hard to make Shizuoka City famous as model capital of Japan. When hobby shows began in 1959, Japanese plastic models did not compete to American products. Now, however, Japanese manufacturers produce most new products and their products are one of the best in the world with good performance, low cost and strong sales. An artificial intelligence exhibition was recently organized in Tokyo showcasing the latest advancements in technology. Software companies developing artificial intelligence exhibited their technology and inventions to guests and visitors hoping to grab a bigger business opportunity. The Japanese branch of NTQ, a Vietnamese company, mainly develops AI for cinema and image processing. テクノロジー自体は、えっと、グローバルどこに出してもそうアイテクノロジーリコグナイズディフィカルトシェイプスアンドカラー。アイテクノロジーリコグナイズディフィカルトシェイプスアンドカラー。アイテクノロジーリコグナイズディフィカルトシェイプスアンドカラー。アイテク
for shogi battle simulation before artificial intelligence became common. In Japan, shogi matches between professionals, human and AI is paid attention. With the world slowly transitioning towards digital transformation, artificial intelligence is creating and expanding opportunities for the future. Moving on, there are different ethnic communities in Nepal who follow their own traditions, cultures and festivals. Today, we will take you to show the cultural extravaganza of Kirat community which recently celebrated the Ubhauli festival. The major highlight of the celebration is Sakela dance which is performed by community members to pay respects to their ancestors and nature. People from Nepal's ethnic Kirat community gathered in large numbers in capital Kathmandu to mark Udhauli, the day when people across the country mark the beginning of the Nepalese New Year. Donned in traditional attires, beating drums and cymbals, people gathered in a ground to greet each other with Sakela dance a unique dance performed to please gods. They participated in different activities that also involved the imitation of birds and animals. Udhauli, which is celebrated every year on Baisak Salkapurnima, also marks the setting off of farming season and the arrival of summers. Bhauli Parva, Maneko Sai, Amilajun, Anna Bali, Amisuru Garsum, they like Bhauli Parva, Mati Danza, and just like the Amile, Yoda Kul Pitri, Ava Amro, Devalio, Yoi, Ami Amisopa, Anna Bali, Kodo Kozan, Eta, Titora, Ahna Bos, Bisak Poison, Dehara, Ahna, Molik, Dehamsu, Aina, Molik, Amile, Hawk, it's a Ava Lide, Ayo, Poila Testa Kiena. अनि अहिले जुन जाति सबैको त अहिले कुल पूजा हुन्छ नि हामी यो कुल पूजा कुल देवता हामीले समझेर हामीले उत्थान गरिरहा छौं अनि हामीले जुन हाम्रो अब अहिले अन्नबाली छर्ने बेलालाई उभौली भन्छौं अब मङ्सिरे पूर्णे हुन्छ त्यसलाई चाहिँ हामी अन्नबाली काटेर ढुकुटीमा राख्छौं त्यसलाई उधौली मानिन्छ अनि अहिले अन्नबाली राम्रो फलोस हाम्रो लालाबाला राम्रो पढोस उन्नति प्रगति गरोस भनेर हामीले यो गरेको छौं the festival is an annual tradition which suffered a halt of two years owing to the curbs imposed in the country following COVID outbreak. People also worship their ancestors and nature, seeking good health and a good harvest. They hold a strong belief that if their ancestors and nature is not worshipped in the prescribed manner, then they are bound to face their wrath. However, the most prominent feature of the festival continues to remain the Sakela dance. People say the festival had lost its charm when the devotees were not allowed to perform dance due to COVID. Earlier, people would climb mountains following the celebration of the festival to avoid summer heat, but the practice has gradually waned. The rituals of Sakela dance, however, are performed exactly the way they used to be in earlier times. The dance style, also known as Silly, reflects different aspects of human life and human relation with nature.
This dancing ritual starts with Chula Puja, which is essentially the worship of kitchen. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.